So welcome everybody to our National Braille Week celebration, uh, our lunchtime chat all about Braille, uh, which is a collaborative um, session with Sight and Sound Technology, UCAF and the Braillists Foundation. My name is Stuart Lawler. I'm from Sight and Sound Technology and my colleague Fanula Murphy from Sight and Sound Technology is also here with me. And we're delighted to be uh, hosting this session today. I suppose at Sight and Sound Technology, Braille is so much a key part of what we do in the technology we support, but it's also part of um, a wider, um, a wider, I suppose, uh, passion within our company that we want to make sure people have the tools to allow them to have access to um, information and Braille for so many of the customers and people that we work with. Uh, throughout the life cycle, I think, provides that space. We have a wonderful panel joining us today to help us mark this very important week of National Braille Week in the UK. Um, and we'll be, we'll be asking them to, to, say, to say something in just a moment and introduce themselves. Before we do that, though, this session is all about you and your comments and your thoughts about Braille. And if you have something to say, we'd really love to hear it. You can do that in two ways here on the Zoom platform today. You can access the chat by pressing um, Alt and H if you're on a Windows computer, or if you're joining us on um, a mobile device, you can uh, press the chat button uh, on your mobile app and you can type in the chat uh, and Fanula will be, will be monitoring the chat or you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak. The keystroke to do that is Alt and Y or you can activate the raise hand button if you're on a mobile device. We do hope you're going to enjoy the session and we really do want to hear your Braille experiences, your questions, your thoughts, your comments. This is what's going to make this session hopefully a really engaging one. Now I'd like to introduce our panel and um, Ilka Staglin from Child Vision just down the road from me here um, in Dublin. Um, Ilka, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. Would you like to just tell us a little bit about um, your background and, and what you do in Child Vision and maybe uh, your connection to Braille, which is, which is slightly different to the rest of us. And we will probably be talking a little bit more about that in, in a while. Yes, thank you very much, Stuart, and thanks to Sight and Sound for the invite to this session here. As Stuart already said, I'm the odd one out on this panel because I'm the only fully sighted person on the panel. So I've come to Braille in a different way than a lot of other people on this call today. I um, used to teach at university in Sheffield. This is probably about 24 years ago now when I became personal tutor of a totally blind student who had Braille as his um, main medium for study. And I, I started to learn Braille and started to support him because I found that the provision of material to him was very, very slow once you went through student services, Braille production and so on. So um, I, I started off that way in 2000, I moved to Ireland, started to work at the university here as well, and then Child Vision, which was then called St. Joseph's School for the Blind, um, advertised for people who wanted to set up a Braille production centre in Ireland, and I became its manager and spent 17 very happy years um, working directly with Braille. And a few years ago, I then moved more into education. So my job title now is Director of Education at Child Vision. But I'm also wearing a few Braille hats. I'm um, on the board of the Braillists in the UK. And I'm also working with INBAF, which is the Irish uh, National Braille and Alternative Format Association. And I'm a committee member of the International Council on English Braille. Thank you, Ilka. Wow, that's that's very busy, very busy. And, and, and I think it's interesting. There's lots of us wearing, I think, lots of hats when it comes yeah. to Braille. And I think that's interesting in itself because it shows how passionate we all are about Braille. Now, I'm going to go to uh, Roger Furman. Roger is uh, someone who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a long time, actually. And Roger is chair of um, UCAF. Uh, Roger, you're, you're very welcome. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about what you do and maybe your, uh, your own? I know you're a, um, an average Braille user. Stuart, thank you very much. I'm certainly um, an average Braille user. I uh, use Braille 
every day. Um, as Stuart says, I'm currently chair of UK Association for Accessible Formats. And obviously Braille is imp important to the association. It's extremely important to me on a personal level because of my, not only my day-to-day -day work, which is running my own business Golden called transcribing printed music into Braille, but I also use Braille in other ways as a uh, musician and obviously for, you know, for reading and leisure purposes. So Braille has always been with me and it is just, it's just so important to me. And um, as we'll, I'm sure, discuss later, it's, um, I couldn't live without it. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. Uh, Roger, thanks very much. Very powerful uh, intro there. And um, last but by no means least, Matthew Horspool is, uh, Matthew is also, he wears lots of hats, but um, Matthew is uh, part of UCAF. He's a subject specialist and he's also a member of the Brailless Foundation. Uh, he's on the board of directors. And Matthew, you're very welcome. Great to have you here. Indeed. Thank you very much, Stuart, for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, yeah, as you say, I work, um, I, I'm the Braille subject lead for the UK Association for Accessible Formats. So I work quite closely with Roger and uh, James Bowden and uh, other people within UCAF and ICEB. Um, I'm part of the Braillists Foundation. Uh, many people will know me as the person who answers the help address and the person who uh, presents the Braillecast podcast. That's a lot of fun. I quite enjoy doing that. And uh, if you were part of the ICEB General Assembly uh, last year and listened to the live stream, you'll have heard my dulcet tones there. And um, my day job is with a little organisation called Torch Trust, and I have some very interesting Braille work there. Uh, my job's not entirely Braille focused, but uh, I get to talk to churches about Braille Bibles and Braille hymn books and uh, how they can get Braille into their churches. And we've got some exciting announcements, although we're not quite ready to make them yet but hopefully before Christmas about getting accessible Christian literature onto Braille displays and things like that. So, uh, yeah, it's all very exciting for Braille and myself at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. So it certainly sounds exciting and sounds that you're extremely busy too. I think everyone's extremely busy on the panel, so we're very grateful for your time. I, I wanted to maybe start by, and, and I guess we've, we've sort of talked a little bit about this already, but people's journey learning Braille. In many cases, and I was thinking of my own journey, and I should probably mention for anyone who doesn't know, I'm blind as well, and I use Braille all the time. And, you know, it was, I guess, for, 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 uh, for those of us who are Braille users, we talk all the time about how different our lives would be if we didn't have Braille. But we come back to that in a while. But I think the Braille learning journey for many of us is interesting. There can often be a figure or figures who really supported us to learn Braille. And I might put that question to Matthew first, and then we'll maybe go around the, the panel. Matthew, what, what was learning Braille like for you way back? Was it a, was it a drudge or was it exciting? Um, learning Braille was fun. Using Braille, not so much. Uh, <laughs> it was one of those things I just thought, why on earth do I have to do this? And then as I did it more and more and more, I thought, yes, actually, this, this makes a lot of sense. And by the time I got to secondary school, I really enjoyed um, using Braille. Uh, but no, learning Braille was fun because I got to learn about all these exciting new contractions and things like this. And it was also completely normal for me. I, I've been blind since birth. I went to Priestley Smith School in Birmingham, which is a school for the blind, but it's one of those unusual school for the blind, the schools for the blind that is a day school and state run. So I didn't have to board, um, but I did have expert Braille tuition there from a very small age and class sizes were very small. It was a primary school as well as a secondary school. Class sizes were very small. We're talking about, you know, I think at one point there were three people in my class. And um, I learned Braille while the other two partially sighted people learnt print, you know, so I didn't have to do handwriting lessons. I did Braille while they did handwriting and it all just felt normal. And uh, I've got memories of spelling tests where it was the norm that you had to write the word in grade one and then you had to write the word in grade two so that you knew how to spell it and you also mm -hmm. knew how to contract it. And I used to have a lot of fun in those spelling tests. I, I spent more time making pretty tables so that I could put grade one down the left hand side and grade two down the right hand side than I did actually doing the spelling. And um, yeah, it was, was, was all a lot of fun. And um, when I came back, my, my first job 
um, after leaving school and college and university was a Texel Grange school, which was a very similar school to Priestley Smith in many ways. And I was horrified that people weren't doing their Braille tests in grade one and grade two. And um, so that was one of the first things I introduced was grade one and grade two spelling tests. And, and I, I actually want to go back to spelling in a couple of minutes, uh, Matthew, because you, you raise an interesting point there and we were chatting about it just before we came on air. I, just before we continue, I see we've been joined by quite a few more people, which is great. You're all very welcome to our National Braille Week celebration with Sight and Sound Technology, um, UCAF and the Brailleist Foundation. We'd love to hear your feedback and thoughts and comments. You can enter in the chat by pressing Alt and H or activate the chat button, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to speak to us by pressing Alt and Y. Now, um, Ilka, let, let's just come to you for a sec, because you, like, I, I still think this is incredible. It, it's wonderful that you, as a tutor to a student, took on to learn Braille because you felt the provision for him was too slow, and you said, let's do something about it. But what, how did you do it? What was available to you on your own, taking on this pretty significant task back in the late 90s? Um, I think I was very lucky in that my then head of department was very supportive. So together with another colleague, I went to the Sheffield College and did an introduction to visual impairment course, which was fascinating and really incredibly well put together. And you had some basic Braille tuition there. So I got the books and then it was a question of a bit of self-study, modeling through, getting some help from the student himself. And I also need to say that the student studied German at the university at the time. So he was struggling with German Braille, whereas I, as a German speaker, struggled with English Braille. So we kind of um, communicated quite well. It was, it was a kind of similar struggle, but um, it was tough because I didn't have, you know, a wide community or so. I had somebody in student services. But I, I really enjoyed it and I could see that it made a difference and its experience I really profited from later in life because I also taught language classes in which the student was a student in. And, you know, people always ask about what is it like to teach integrated classes with sighted and non-sighted people. My experience is it is absolutely feasible, but you do need to put the extra time in and prepare well. Without preparation, um, you're out at sea. So when I moved into alternative format production, that was one of the things I always spoke about with teachers and said, you know, you need to face up to that, that there is work involved, but I think the mutual benefits are, are really huge. Thanks, Ilka. And it's interesting, uh, Ilka, and I, and I should add that we have been friends for a long, long many years, Ilka and yeah. I, and I have rarely seen a, I don't think I've ever seen actually, a sighted person who is so passionate about Braille. You know, you see lots of, of, lots of users of Braille. Obviously, we're all very passionate about the format that we read every day, but it's rare you'll see sighted people who are equally, if not more, in some respects, passionate about it. So I think that's really worth saying. Thank um, you. Roger, I, I'd love to know about a little about your Braille learning journey. Was it was it um, was it like Matthews? Were you creating nice tables as you did your spelling tests? So how how did it work for you? No, it's uh, quite different from Matthews. Which, so it's fantastic to hear about Matthews' story. Um, from a very young age, I have memories of learning to read Braille. That would have been uncontracted Braille Grade One, and. And then the day arrived and I was introduced, probably age six, I was introduced to the writing frame. And uh, that posed some interesting um, issues. Well, obviously, those who know the writing frame where you're writing from right to left and letters the other way around to, to how you read them. And uh, so I think I, you know, in all truth, that took me a while to get to grips with the writing frame but um, I think my journey then I was able to move on to something like the Stainsby and then the Perkins Brailler but very interestingly from quite a young age probably I, d I don't remember it might have been seven or eight I was introduced to Braille music and began that journey as well so and it's it's interesting because at that time of life you have no idea where all these things are going to lead and what you know obviously what's ahead of you and 
obviously it has proved in my case to be absolutely crucial significant in you know what I now do and so glad that I had those opportunities you know that I wasn't denied the opportunity opportunity to learn braille music or, or braille and you know quite the reverse so that's my beginnings of getting into braille I'd agree with you, uh, Roger. I, and I was introduced to Braille music around the same age as you, I think. And it wasn't a big thing to learn Braille music alongside my literary Braille. I suppose I had a foundation in literary Braille, but mm. I think at that age, you just take it all in. And as you say, you don't know what bits, where where these bits are going to take you. No. But uh, it's, it's certainly interesting. Um, just a quick reminder again, I know we have a couple of things coming in on chat and we will go to Fanula in a, in a couple of minutes to check in but if you want to chat you can do it with Alton H. We'd love to hear your Braille thoughts. How did you start learning? Any fond memories or not so fond memories maybe of Braille or you can raise your hand with Alton Y and we'd love to hear your voice as well as part of this session. Now I want to go on to a I suppose a, a big topic which is UEB Unified English Braille and let's be very open and say it has not been without its controversy over the years. I think it's fair to say that. Uh, I think here in Ireland, it passed through very smoothly. Um, and we can maybe chat about that in a sec. But it, there have been, um, I think, UEB people in some quarters have very strong views on it. Roger, I might start with you on this one from um, um, a UCAF perspective, maybe to, to just think a little bit or talk to us a little bit about what you believe UEB has done for the for the code because it's it was a pretty big change wasn't it it was a big project it was indeed and whilst it may have taken us a few you know, us in in the uk a few years to think through uh, many of the issues and i think that was born to some extent before UCAF came into being through the diligence and the care that people wanted to take within the Braille Authority of the United Kingdom to look at this and just see, well, you know, ask perhaps some of the difficult questions, where where were we going to go with it? Was it change for change's sake? And that's me putting words into their mouth, but I think they, they wanted to be clear about what the implications would be. And I'm I'm certainly very clear in my mind that UEB has been a big advantage. It makes production of Braille, certainly text, much more possible and accurate than I think formerly was the case. However, on a personal level, and I, and I do want to be clear about this, this is I am talking this next point on, on my own personal level rather than a UCAF level, that I just and it may become clear from what other people have to say on this point. I'm just interested to know, for instance, whether people find it a wonderful experience from a leisure reading point of view, depending what you're reading, does, you know, does some of the uh, additional information tend to get in the way or is it just something you skim over and have no problems with? Um, it's, I know people who do find that some of the uh, additional information can get in the way and stop it being pleasurable. I think I'm somewhere in the middle of it, but however, I would far rather be on the side of the road that is enabling more Braille to be produced more easily. So therefore we get much more material and help and improve accessibility. Okay, uh, thanks very much, um, Roger. It, it makes me think. Just when, when you mentioned there, I was on a, uh, I was on a flight last week, and uh, I was offered the Braille safety guide, and I will always take it because you know I kind of feel if I don't, if people say yes, no, they'll absolutely. say no one's going to use this stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I did read it, and it's in standard English Braille. It was pre UEB, and I remember thinking, this is wrong. There's something wrong here, and because you've got so used to UEB. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, um, Ilka, I, I was curious to get your take on this because you were heavily involved with. UEB's um, implementation here in Ireland. In fact, you were you were leading on that. But I think you had some you also had some interesting points to make in how it has helped uh, the development of other language codes in Braille. Yes, indeed. Um, we were we were very lucky in Ireland in that people really followed through with it. We held a lot of um, information meetings, 
And maybe just to say in terms of the success, we had worked out an implementation plan together with the State Examinations Commission, who is responsible for transcribing exams into Braille. And we had hoped that by 2020, everything would be in UEB. And it was actually the students in secondary schools pushing for it to have it implemented earlier. So we were nearly done with it by 2018. So that was very good that it came from Braille readers themselves who saw an advantage in using the same symbols, whether it was working in computing or sciences or um, straightforward literary Braille. Um, in terms of languages, we updated the Irish Braille code in line with UEB. And that's something that also happened in parallel in Wales for Welsh Braille and previous to us in South Africa. And they have lots of native languages. So they did that exercise several times around. So we found that UEB lent itself to doing that in that most of the punctuation signs and the overall layout conventions were then adapted for the foreign language. And that worked really, really well. And the idea behind it was that children learning Braille wouldn't have to relearn basic signs um, if they were learning a different language. Um, so that was adopted and has been improved on since and was very positive experience over here. Thanks, Ilka. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, definitely around the uh, Irish code and I've seen really positive stuff come out of that project as well. Um, Matthew, what's, what's UEB been like for you or what are your thoughts around what it has done for the Braille code? Well, the first thing to say sort of um, with my UCAF hat on is that although it is a big change to the Braille code and absolutely it is, I'm not denying that, it's not the only set of changes that we've had in the Braille code over the years. There was a set of changes in 2004 to do with italics. Um, if you, you know, remember back in the sort of mid to late 80s, we were still using the EA sign in precedence to the mm. AR sign, you know. So Braille yeah. has been changing oh, anyway. Yes. UEB, to me, doesn't feel like as big a revolution as as perhaps people are, are, are other people are thinking of it as it feels just more like the next evolution of braille really maybe that's because i'm too young to remember how badly the previous set of changes went down i don't know um <laughs> but um, for me personally the biggest thing about ueb is the fact that it, it is back translatable uh, there's lots of emphasis on forward translation and not enough emphasis on back translation and ueb came in and started to become popular in quotes at about the same time as the iPhone gained Braille screen input. And Braille screen input for me was an absolute game changer in terms of being able to send text messages and, and type on a touchscreen at pretty much as fast as a sighted person could do it. Maybe fractionally slower, but nowhere near as fractionally slower as it was you know, to that point. And um, around about that that time um i was in a relationship with a, a sighted girl i mean I'll, I'll be 30 in february so you know I'm, I'm fairly young and i was i was in a relationship and it was a very happy relationship and uh, she insisted on sending me smiley faces and uh, i thought well yes okay that this is great but I, I i probably ought to you know send her some smiley faces back and realized that of course if i'm in seb the brackets, I'm, I'm talking about colon, left bracket, colon, right bracket, smiley faces here. And mm. um, the brackets in SEB are the same. It's a lower G. So actually, most of the time, the translator would work. If I did a colon and a lower G, it would translate as a, as a smiley face. But if I, for some reason, wanted to put a sad face in, it would never work. And just to be able to have different signs for the brackets so that I could do this reliably in Braille screen input and send it off and, dare I say, it, look normal... Um, you know, to me, this was just absolutely brilliant. And, and there have been various things since then where there's just you think, yeah, there's there's no ambiguity here. I can type something. The translator knows what I want. It will translate it properly. And I don't have to worry about, you know, do I need a letter sign here or do I need a, you know, a, a special sign here to eradicate this contraction? It, it all just works. Yeah, I know it, it comes up frequently here when we're doing um, when we're doing tech support for people and you you come across people who are using um uk braille and you're trying to you're trying to convince them you know uh very quietly to maybe to maybe switch because it might be easier to move to uh, to ueb for all sorts of reasons that the panel have outlined already um now i'm just going to go to fanula because i think we had some messages in chat and we may have had i don't know if there was a hand went up but it may have gone down so mm. fanula, have we anyone that you want to reference 
We had a hand up. I, I didn't quite catch who, who it was, but if you want to put your hand back up, now is the time. Um, and yeah, nothing too much in the chat yet. Just a comment there from Derry about spelling when you mentioned that, Stuart, and just oh, the, yeah. the, the importance of of spelling and the impact of grade two Braille on that and, and possibly the negative impact, I suppose, when you're not learning to spell. <clears throat> Uh, it's Judith, Judith Fierce is, uh, I think, has hand, hand was up and then was down and has just gone back up again. So, Judith, um, we should be able to bring you in, I think. Um, oh, I, I see it now. Sorry, Stuart. Yeah, I, I see Judith. Yeah, you can un unmute yourself there, so, Judith. So Judith, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. I think, I think we have you, Judith. Yeah, can you hear me? We can. Yes, How are we you? can, Judith. <laughs> right. So I was going to say, first of all, about learning Braille, that um, I was really thrilled to learn Braille because I started to lose my sight when I was six. And I just really, you know, started reading print books very avidly and then couldn't read them. And so when I got to Linden Lodge School and I started to learn Braille, I was absolutely thrilled, you know, and I sort of raced, raced through it because I could read books again. Um, and I use Braille every single day, not just because I'm a Braille producer, but I use it for, my, for myself. Um, but I did want to say something about UEB. I don't like UEB. I'll be quite honest about that. I think it's very clumsy. Um, there's a lot of spaces. We don't, we've lost some of our symbols. I hate all the italics and bold signs. Uh, it drives me nuts. Um, I can understand what the panel is saying about the advantages. And if that, that works for other people, that's, that's great. Um, as a producer, I actually run two systems because a lot of my customers are older people and they do, don't want UEB. So I give them SEB. Um, and I, but I use UEB as def the default, obviously now because it's you know it's the thing. But for people who want SEB, I still do SEB. I still use SEB myself, and um, I do think that um, it has put a lot of people off. I know a lot of people who stop getting Braille magazines because they just don't enjoy reading anymore because we have all these extra you know dots and signs around the place, and I think that's very sad. And I don't know quite what can be done about it. But certainly when I transcribe, I find Duxbury has a tendency to throw every sign in the book at it. You get italics and bold and so on. And I, I strip a lot of it out because I just think this is much too clumsy to read. Um, and most of the time people don't need multiple um, signs. So I think that's a pity and I don't know what could be done about it. But I, I do think it's something that, that ought to be um, addressed really. Can okay, I come in thanks, on that thanks one? Judith. Yeah, please. I was going to see if anyone on the panel wants to jump in. Matthew. Yeah, sure. I mean, so first of all, I, I can, having just waxed lyrical about UEB, can I absolutely see where you're come, coming from, Judith. And um, I've recently taken up slating. I'm the opposite of Roger, who's used a, a writing frame all his life. You know, I've, I've only recently come to it. And I sort of think, yes, actually, if I could use some of these SEB signs in my slating, it would make me much quicker. Um, so, you know, what you use at home is what you use at home. And, and I think we probably need to have a more concerted effort to um, bring back, if not in, uh, you know, mainstream writing, if you like, uh, bring back an awareness of some of these signs and an awareness of some shorthand codes in general um, to, to make note taking a bit more efficient. Um, but in terms of the bold and the italics and the underlining, um, this has been an ongoing problem for a long time. And I think um, blaming Braille isn't entirely the right answer, although I can see why people do it. Uh, there are definitely provisions in UEB not to use those signs. So, I mean, thanks very much, Judith, for taking them out. That's exactly what the, the transcriber needs to do. It's just a shame that transcribers feel the, 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 that they have to do that. We, we need to get to a point where the source documents, the Word documents that people are sending through are styled up in such a way that these signs don't appear. If you if you style up a document properly, Duxbury won't import all of this extra stuff because it knows that it's just stuff that it doesn't need to import. But people don't know how to make those Word documents and we need to be much better at, at you know, using styles instead of fonts and things like this. And this mm -hmm. will definitely help this problem. This, this is a huge issue, I think, for transcribers. The source document is often, uh, shall we say, less than helpful. Uh, in the way it's styled and set up and so I seem to spend a lot of my time um, kind of overriding that and so sort of trying to make it more yeah. user friendly for the, yeah. for the you know the end Absolutely. user mm -hmm. and I, I and I you know I you know you can't teach the whole world to do word properly so I don't know quite know what the answer is but I, it's it's a continuing frustration I'm sure it is for all braille producers mm -hmm. it certainly is for me yeah 
I spent so much time at Excel doing this sort of stuff that in the end, I just used to save it as a text file and bring it back into Word and start from scratch because it was easier to start from scratch than it was to try and repair somebody else's badly done Word document. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think I would just add that I, I think it's I think it's really a really positive thing that you know that we are having these kind of conversations and we we you know we want to find ways forward. So I think with that spirit in mind, there is no reason why. I mean, as Matthew was kind of indicating, well, and you can, you know, um, from their perspectives, if it is possible to, as you say, to have an option so that if, we, if a book, for instance, um, well, anything, as you say, as a source file, can, you can choose whether you want to have everything or, you know, less. So you could have perhaps different different types of things along the way you could either have or you know but it's important that these choices are are there and you know not you know that people who are expressing these views aren't thought of as being oh philistines of the 17th century um, but you know you know what i mean because obviously braille wasn't around there. yeah but but you you know that we have these open positive discussions and find ways forward by which because what we don't want to do in the end is to is we want to encourage people to be using braille not putting them off using braille <laughs> and for those who who are finding these things that they just don't want it done in this way so let's go on having the discussions okay thanks roger matthew and thank you uh, judith for your question we appreciate appreciate that um, I'm just going to really quickly, because we have a raised hand, because I, I want to do go back to one or two other points with the panel, but we have Liz McGlucky, who has her hand raised for a little while. So Liz, um, just you, add should, Liz there. you should, oh yeah, thanks Vanula. You should be able to unmute yourself, I think. You might just need to respond to the unmute request, Liz, and we should be able to hear you. Um, if. If not, we'll come back to you. Okay, we might come back to we might come back to Liz in a sec. Um, I wanted to put a, a, a bit of a query to the panel, and I suppose it's something that all of us have been asked, I'm sure, on numerous occasions. How can I learn Braille? Um, for sighted or blind people, I suppose. And there is obviously a difference in how sighted and blind people will learn Braille. Um, so Ilka, I know you've been You've been doing lots of this stuff for, for quite a few years and you're still doing it. Yes. <laughs> um, Child Vision is running a Learn Braille course mostly for parents of children who are learning Braille or teachers as an ace. Um, and we have developed this course over now, I think we're doing the 13th or 14th year now. Um, it was accredited for at further education level. It's now accredited by our Braille Association and it's based on the Birmingham Braille course. Steve McCall um, gave us the production rights to the Birmingham Braille course and we have tailored our course around it. So it's not exclusive. We also had participants who were visually impaired who mm -hmm. learned Braille again for the support of somebody. But if we had a tactile reader, I would structure things very, very differently. But we would make that possible as well. What, what kind of feedback do you get from people who are, who are taking it on? I suppose, you know, people, I, I, and I know I've had the pleasure of, of talking to some of the participants yeah. over the years. <laughs> what, what do people say to you? Because they're taking it on. It's a pretty significant thing to take that on in the middle of everything else you're doing in life. I think um, everybody's very enthusiastic at the beginning. And once you hit stage four and things um, are not quite as straightforward anymore, um, they take a little break and realize, yes, this is a little bit more work than, than they thought it would be at the beginning. But what we're trying to do is to kind of um, demonstrate how important it is to have correct braille, to have well embossed braille because most people on the course are sighted learners which means they're learning braille by sight but they also have to have an understanding that if you know the braille isn't properly embossed if they're not pressing down on the perkins key properly what's coming out can suddenly have a very different meaning and to to get that shift from visual perception to tactile perception in the learners. We put a lot of time into that and talk about that. And um, 
all our um, test papers are moderated by um, a braille reader, a non-sided braille reader, just to make sure that, that we have that standard throughout. And I think that's very important, whatever braille course you're on, that um, you get good feedback on what you can improve on in your braille learning. Okay, thanks very much, Ilka. It's a it's a great program, by the way. I can I can speak to that from having talked to lots of the participants over the years. Uh, Matthew, you you guys at the Brailleists just put out a bulletin this morning. Timing was perfect about your Braille for Beginners course, which I understand. I think is this the second second uh, course you've run? Well, we're calling it the third one, but it's the second. Um major one if you like we um as as we've already talked about learning braille by sight and learning braille by touch is very different learning braille as a child and learning braille as an adult is also very different and uh, during the the lockdown of 2020 you know way back in sort of march april may time we had a few people coming to us and say that we're adults we'd like to learn braille um where do we go what can we do and so we ran um we didn't really know what we were doing, but we had a load of people with fingerprint. And we found somebody who knew fingerprint and we said, right, OK, let's run a session and see where we go. And that session, I mean, that gosh, that ran for like six or nine months or something. It was crazy. Uh, and they got all the way through fingerprint. They learned how to read their writing, wasn't really assessed, but their reading was. And they, they did uh, very well through that. We refined that in uh, 2021. Yes, that's right. And we ran a 12 week version of that in 2021. And uh, in 2022, we're refining it slightly more. So um, it's free of charge. It's eight weeks long. And we really are going to be calling it Braille for beginners. So this is for people who want to touch read their adults. They want to touch read Braille and it will get them through the alphabet, numbers, punctuation and, you know, introduce uh, reading skills we're, we're, again it's mostly reading we're not going to be doing an awful lot of work on writing we'll talk about writing but we don't have the capacity to um to, to mark papers and stuff like that and we'll be basing it on the fingerprint course which means that if people you know like what they've done so far and they want to carry on and self-study through grade two they can do that or maybe it will equip them to go and find a braille club at a local society for the blind or something so that they can do grade two and that's something that further down the line we'll hopefully be working with local societies for the blind to try and get them to run you know braille classes and to try and help them uh, run their braille classes so uh, yeah that's what our braille for beginners looks like but registration's open this morning it's at braillists.org slash beginners and uh, it starts in january 2022 for eight weeks so plenty of time and a great um, new year's resolution matthew for someone who says i'm, I'm gonna yeah we were saying this this morning we were saying we should <laughs> yeah. put out a bulletin on world braille day this is you know, new year's resolution learn yeah. braille so if you've <laughs> if you've indulged yourself over christmas too much and you want to do something new in january you can learn braille That's right. okay i i am going to go back to the panel in a sec um because we we have another question that we, we that we ask these guys to think about uh, a little ahead of the event today but um uh, yeah, I just was conscious that we have Liz and we have Derry with their hands raised. So we might try, uh, Liz, I'm going to try bringing you back in again. I just uh, brought Liz back in there a minute ago, okay. Stuart. Um, so it's just if you can unmute Liz, Stuart, I don't know, is there a quick uh, keyboard stroke think, for that? I don't know if Zoom pops up. Uh, I, I, have, I think Zoom might just say to you unmute and there should be an unmute button. Yeah, you can Liz. try Alt-A. Alt-A. Alt Alt-A might do it, yeah. Um, and if not, Liz, if you want to put your query, if you want to, if this doesn't work, you want to try and type, press Alt and H and type your query in chat. We'll, uh, we'll try and get to you. I brought I, I, I Derry have... in there. Hiya, Derry. Hi, it's George and everybody. Hey, keeping. Good to see you. Good. Uh, quick question for you. Just, uh, I've been reading Braille since 1977, there, there, but my speed has never got very fast and just was any hints on how to speed up the reading of braille and also uh, embossers what are the latest embossers for, for producing braille at home they're not a commercial so i think this is a really interesting question i'm going to before i throw this out to the panel i'm going <laughs> to just mention um something because Derry, I'm, I'm kind of a bit like you i think but i was doing a piece of research years ago for a gentleman called Professor Michael Tobin from the University of Birmingham, who Roger and Matthew certainly may be aware of. Um, and he was telling me, we were talking about Braille reading speed, and he said, your silent reading will always be faster than your, your out loud voice. But I think that's probably the same for sighted people because we could become more conscious. But uh, 
any tips from the panel around braille reading speed? Maybe Ooh. we'll we'll start with start with Roger on this one and go around the go around the panel. Any to thoughts, honest, Roger? To, no, I'm. I, I mean, to be honest, I'm not a I'm not a teacher or anything. Uh, you know, braille teacher. So I think it. You know, for those who've got more, more expertise in the area, it'd be far more sensible to hear comments from them rather than me. <laughs> okay, let's go to Ilka and see if Ilka has any thoughts on braille reading, speeding it up. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to remember what I learned on this because I'm not a braille teacher, but I did take the course for the QTVIs in, in Birmingham. And if I remember correctly, it's a mixture of... Um, reading technique, tracing technique, how you are following from line to line. You could probably practice and improve on this. Mm. Um, other than that, I think it's a lot of reading different material um, and just getting used to um, encountering all kinds of different words, different contraction in different contexts that would make you, I think, quicker in coming upon material that has been unknown so far. Thank okay, thanks Ilke. Uh, Matthew, anything you want to add in terms of speeding up your reading? Well, I'd, I'd like to plug the Braillists. Um, there's, there's precious little research that's been done into this. We found somebody who's been looking into this quite extensively and is, is doing some research into it um, called Kit Aronoff. And uh, Kit's going to be doing a session for the Braillists next Tuesday at half past seven in the evening uh, on this very topic of how to improve reading speed. Excellent. Uh, so go, come brilliant. along to the Braillist session and you'll, oh, yeah. you'll find yeah. out everything there is. But I would concur with what Ilka said. It's about reading, um, you know, try and find some short articles that are in a style that you're not especially familiar with and read them and then read them out loud and, you know, try and do it regularly you know i mean once a day or something you know at the very least once a week and get the fluency up and then once the fluency is up you can gradually increase how quickly you can read what's which maybe just one follow-on question to that then um and this is something i've personally found and this is probably more for um for roger and uh for matthew do, do you guys find you read quicker on paper or on braille display because i certainly find i'm i'm more fluent on paper and i think that's because my one finger traces onto the next line almost picking up little bits ahead of of the yeah. finger that i'm reading with yeah i, th I think I, I for myself yes i think i i would say that and i, I know it's quite interesting this this idea about you know m moving your left hand before you finish the line moving your left hand onto the next line it but interesting i know that doesn't always work for some people because some people for instance read with one hand only and uh you know so so there are really are different techniques for reading but yes i i'm i am better reading on paper than the braille display but i'm very glad to have the braille display yeah absolutely yeah, <laughs> matthew any any thoughts from you on braille reading on sorry reading on braille display versus paper or depends what it is i'm trying to read um i uh, I'm young enough to have gone to school and been taught on braille note takers and things like this. So I'm very comfortable with braille displays. I read books, uh, you know, when we were reading Shakespeare and things like this, I had the choice of either bringing five volumes of braille or a text file on a braille note taker. And I opted mm. for the text file. So I got very good at reading things like Shakespeare on braille displays and reading my essays on braille displays. Um, so I, I think I actually prefer reading if i'm just reading i prefer reading on a braille display and i feel like i'm quicker at it but it, interestingly if i'm presenting then i find that i'm better at locating things on paper because there's three dimensions you can you can find paragraphs you can find space you know you can you can do all of that sort of thing a lot quicker and i sing in the choir at coventry cathedral and there's no way i would ever do that with a braille display Partly no, because I think it would look paper. very strange because everybody else would be using paper. But also there are conventions like, you know, the chorus of the hymn is in italics. And just to be able to find that italicized passage really quickly with one finger is something that I'd have to learn a whole new habit to do that effectively on a Braille display, I think. Interesting story, uh, Matthew, when you talk about presenting when you're using paper. And a friend of mine told me years ago that he was presenting at something, left his notes on a seat while he went up to get some water, was talking to somebody, and he came back and somebody was sitting in his seat, had sat on the notes, 
and then he was trying to yes. uh, rescue his notes and read from them. <laughs> Not yes. without its perils, I think, you know. You see, people say, oh, you should always present from paper because what if the battery goes flat on your Braille display? And yeah. you say, yes, well, what if, what if the dots what go if? flat? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, thanks. Anyway, um, uh, but I would to, I would say if very... I can just do do a little plug that I I mean for for me personally I have found um, because of the work I do using the Canute extremely helpful when I need to you know have multi line braille displays particularly for music. So, yes, and the so... Canute is a, an amazing amazing device. That's 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 only going to get better. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. So thanks, Derry, for the question. Yeah, Please thank you. that very much. Good yeah. to good to hear you. Derry um, was asking about braille embossers. Um, sorry, just just very quickly on that. Uh, I'm a great fan of index embossers, and uh, Sight and Sound will be very happy to hear that because they sell index embossers. But the new version five index embossers, in my opinion, is where to go for a good embosser. Yeah, index are uh, they're a bit of a, a workhorse, I suppose you'd say. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll they'll kind of go forever, so we do like them. Um, okay, we have a couple of minutes left. Uh, there is a raised hand from Mike Townsend, and um, it's great to see Mike here today. Yeah. So, Fanula, I don't know if we can bring Mike in. Sorry, um, Stuart, trying to unmute myself there and let Mike in at the same time. Yeah, Mike, if you unmute yourself there. So, Mike, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yeah, there you go. How are you, Mike? If you're uh, unmuted there. Um, oh, Mike, you were unmuted. Now you're muted. Yeah, now you're unmuted. Can you hear Hi, me Mike. now? We can hear you. How are you? Oh, oh dear, the technology today. <laughs> um, speeding up reading speed, um, I would say train up extra fingers, at least two would help a great deal and you can do it just by reading with one finger the one that you don't normally use and train it up with that i've been quite uh, i was talking at the braille meeting the other day concerned about braille uh, blind children learning braille and quite often i've been to two schools recently and they've been very um, stilted in their reading and when i've read them stories the, the teachers have been amazed that you can read continuously so what I'm saying is that they need to be taught and you need to think about the content of what you're reading and not just the code. It's not a decoding process. Mm -hmm. It's a, an actual getting into the content. And someone told me when I was quite young, uh, I, I lost my full sight when I was eight. Um, I had a bit before, I was partially sighted before. And if you're um, Miss Chamberlain of Royal School of Industry, Bristol was the one who really got me into reading Braille with the Radiant Way series, if anyone can remember those. But I lost my remaining sight quite suddenly and ended up in hospital and I couldn't do anything else other than lie on my back and read Braille. So that got me up to real speed. However, what they said was, don't just go for accuracy when you're trying to increase your speed. Just go for meaning and you may miss the odd word or miss the odd code, but it, it'll speed you up and try and not decode. Look at the shapes of the dots, the shapes of the words, because that is how sighted people tend to read by shape rather than by individual stroke and dot and so forth. So um, there's a lot too, and I'm, I'm interested that Braillist Foundation's looking at um, methodology of speeding up reading of Braille because it's so important. Then um, uh, multidimensional Braille, we did raise this a bit at the ICEB and I do think multidimensional Braille understanding of, of literacy, where things are on the page or the structure of a document are very important. And we lose a lot of that with the window into Braille with our note takers and our little displays. And that's where things like the Canute come in because they can give um, a full page or well, uh, the uh, approximation of, of a full page. So um, I'm looking forward possibly to get one of those as well. And there are others in the wings possibly coming along with, with multi-line displays but the structure of a document is also important then i i do present from a braille display an 18 cell braille display actually and manage it okay and i don't think people notice quite often they don't even notice i'm using a display they think i do it from memory which is quite a powerful experience i suppose for some and that gets me to one thing we've not mentioned today on braille day and that is that it a braille 
is a key indicator as whether you'll get a job or not. Uh, a lot of blind people, I think it's, they reckon 80%, I saw a stat somewhere, 80% of totally blind people or those nearly blind, 80% um, um, of those that are in, in, in employment are actually Braille users. Mm -hmm. So it's a key indicator as to whether to get a job or not. And I would say that most of the jobs I've done over the years, I would find absolutely impossible without Braille. Um, but there's a lot of stories here. I could go on, Stuart. And the... Thanks. No, thank you, Mike. And I'm definitely glad you've mentioned it. Yeah, the, shut me the, up. The, hey, the, hey. <laughs> the, the, Braille, the Braille and employment piece is definitely one worth mentioning. So thank yeah. you for, for bringing that to our table today. And we appreciate you joining us today. So thanks a million. You, um, could I come in on this one? Yeah, um, Delta, please. Just very briefly, because there was a study out about three years ago, I think, in the States, which also showed... Um, a link between braille literacy and happiness and contentment in life. So in other words, um, the more braille literate participants were, the happier they were with their position in life, more would have had jobs, exactly what um, Mike just said, but it's also general um, happiness in, in life linked to braille, which I thought was very interesting at the time. So are all our panelists happy and content, guys? Yeah, are you, you guys okay? <laughs> I, would, I would add, I mean, yeah. I, I would yeah. just add one word, in, independence as well to, to yeah. the yeah. employment yeah. thing that we, you know, we, these are all important things and we, you know, we can't cover every, absolutely everything, but uh, it, these, it, these are crucial issues. It's, yes. been, it's been really interesting uh, discussion today and we are getting some messages from, on chat from people who are saying they're sorry they have to go, lunch is over and people are thanking us for bringing this, this today. But just before we go, we wanted to, we put a question to our panellists yesterday and I just wanted to take two minutes to go around our, our table. And we asked if you could say one thing to Louis Braille, what would it be? And I'm going to, I'm going to start with Ilka on this one because we haven't started with Ilka yet. So Ilka, if you could say one thing to Louis Braille, what would you say? Um, maybe you could have invented eight dots straight away to give us more <laughs> options. <laughs> okay, fair enough. He'd, he'd like to hear that, I'm sure. Um, Matthew, what would you say to Louis Braille if you could? It sounds really uh, cliche, doesn't it? But I would just say thank you for yeah. giving us this code, um, this, this method of reading and writing that's just enabled us to do so much. Okay. And um, Roger, sorry, what would you say to Louis Braille? I would obviously reiterate what Matthew said. I would thank Louis Braille and, said I, and say that I, I hope we are doing things in the 21st century of which he would approve. And uh, I'm sure that Louis, you know, Louis Braille himself would be pushing at the, the boundaries to make things better. So thank you Great for way. all of that. Brilliant. Great way to end our session. Uh, Roger, Ilka and Matthew, I can't thank you guys enough for coming along, giving your time, but most importantly, sharing your passion for Braille on this National Braille Week and stimulating a really interesting hours chat. We're getting some nice feedback on chat uh, and people are very happy with that. We've thoroughly enjoyed it and it's been a lovely collaboration with our friends at uh, UCAF and the Braillist Foundation. I hope we're going to do this again because I think in some respects, we could have done a whole week of lunchtime sessions about Braille. So maybe that will be next year's challenge, uh, Matthew and Roger. <laughs> we'll come I'm back next year and do that. Uh, thanks to everybody who, who joined us today. And from uh, Fanula Murphy and myself at Sight and Sound Technology, this is Stuart Lawler signing off and thanking everybody for coming along. Have a great rest of National Braille Week. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you.